So today, the topic of our webinar will be AI and big data. So these terms have become quite trendy recently, and we really want to figure out what they actually mean today, and our panelists will be sharing their insights on these matters. So today I'm joined by Dr. Amin Beshti, who is a senior lecturer in data science and also the director of AI Enabled Processes Research Center, and also the head of the Data Analytics Research Lab. We also have Associate Professor Babak Abedin, who is the acting department head for the Department of Actuarial Studies and Business Analytics. And last but not least, we also have Isabel Lee, who is part of the ac academic staff of the Department of Mathematics and Statistics. So we'll now begin the panel discussion. And before we delve deeper into the topic of today of AI and big data, um, it'd be really great if the panelists could just introduce themselves. So um, Amin, would you like to introduce yourself? Uh, thank you, Stephanie, and hi, everyone. Uh, welcome to this webinar. I'm uh, Dr. Amin Beheshti. I'm the director of Artificial Intelligence Enabled Processes Research Center and head of Data Analytics Research Lab. Uh, I'm leading more than 16 active projects with industry uh, and government uh, and uh, in our research lab, you know, we have more than 20 research students specifically focus on data science and data engineering projects. Thank you, Stephanie. Thanks for that, Amin um, and Babak. Uh, hello, Stephanie and hi, everyone, and welcome to, to the session uh, tonight. Uh, my name is Babak Abedin, and I am acting head of department of uh, actuarial studies and business analytics here in the business school. Um, so I have a bachelor in uh, industrial engineering, and upon completion of that, I, I joined um, IT and management consultancy for a number of years, and and following that, I did a PhD in information systems. Um, on UNSW uh, and uh, following that uh, I joined Macquarie University uh, and right now I'm um, heading a department which has expertise uh, in business analytics and uh, modeling and, and, and risk modeling and analysis. Thank you. Thanks for that and Isabel. Hi everyone, my name is Isabel. Um, so I'm a currently a research student in CDC from um, Macquarie University. So I'm also uh, a tutor. So I teach six uh, undergrad classes and two master classes. Um, before my master's, uh, before my uh, studying my uh, research degree, I actually graduated from um, Macquarie University with my master of applied statistics degree. Um, prior prior to my um, master study. I uh, graduated from Moore National University. I studied actual Iowa science before. Um, during my study, I also did a lot of internship, um, like most of you guys. Um, I finished my internship at Mercedes Benz uh, in the finance department. I also interned half a year um, in the insurance company. So very nice to see you guys today. Hopefully, um, we have a lot to talk and then learn deeper about data and also statistics. Thanks, Stephanie. Thanks everyone. Uh, so I guess we would just get started. And I just want to start off by mentioning um, what big data and AI are from, I guess, um, everyone's perspective since it is quite thrown around as big data and AI buzzwords these days and you hear them being um, talked about quite a bit. So I would say that big data does relate to having huge amounts of data and this is really collected from almost anywhere. So you might be um, lots of corporations, organizations collect this data. And then AI stands for artificial intelligence. And it's really talking about intelligent systems which can make decisions on their own um, and also have potentially the power to take away jobs. So what does this mean for individuals? And what do you guys think um, AI and big data do for our world? Um, I mean, oh, may, you might want to start um, with this question. Yeah, sure. So the big data specifically relates to huge amount of information that generated on you know, different uh, data islands from social, open, uh, private, uh, and IoT. Uh, still some people you know, confuse it with large data sets. You know, large data sets, we had it before. Uh, in, you know, I developed courses like big data and big data technology and to help the students understand you know, the concept of big data. I use a motivating scenario in policy where, uh, where police investigators you know, deal with, for example, a specific case. Let's say, for example, Boston Marathon bombing. 
where they are interested to analyze, for example, information generated on social data. So social data by itself you know, is a huge data island. For example, just consider uh, Twitter by itself. So each second is 6,000 tweets, uh, over 500 million tweets uh, every day, you know, which lead to uh, more than 12 terabytes of information. But at the same time, the investigators are interested to analyze the open data, the data generated on news, uh, IoT data, for example, you know, analyzing the CCTV information or any smart entities around the scene. And at the same time, you know, they are quite interested to analyze and understand different islands of data and connect it back to historical uh, police data, which is, for example, private or, for example, uh, business uh, information related to uh, previous cases. So this is a very good example of uh, big data and shows that, you know, huge amount of information generated, you know, everywhere on different islands. And uh, in big data, we are interested, for example, to organizing this huge amount of information, curating, analyzing, processing, and visualizing them. Uh, artificial intelligence specifically is a uh, system's ability to correctly interpret external data. So this data you know, could be big data to learn from such a data and to use you know, those learnings to achieve a specific goals and tasks. So if you look at, for example, the definition of the artificial intelligence, you may uh, identify three main components. So the first component is the external data. So this can be from data to big data. Uh, the second component could be learning. So from machine learning to natural language processing, software as a service, knowledge graphs, crowdsourcing, different technologies you know, that can contribute into learning. And the third component could be uh, goals and tasks. So which is uh, the focus is on business process management and uh, decision making. Uh, having said that, you know, we can uh, identify three different types of AI systems. So the first type could be analytical, where uh, learning based on, for example, past experiences to inform future decisions. So this includes process automation, uh, business process management, or uh, imitating, for example, human action. Uh, the second type could be human inspired, mainly uh, cognitive assistance, you know, to help knowledge workers in processes in decision making, uh, and for example, help them choosing uh, the best next steps in an easy way. And the third type would be humanized artificial intelligence. You know, there are self-conscious uh, and self-aware uh, objects you know, that can, for example, learn and uh, focus on, for example, uh, assisting uh, human in different uh, business and processes. Stephanie, back to you. Yeah, thanks for that. Um, definitely really interesting to hear about lots of the real-world impact of the big data and AI. Um, Babak, is there anything in, in your experience that you'd also like to share about big data's impact on individuals and impact on our world in general? Thank you, Stefania. Very good question. And as you said, you know, there's a lot of buzzwords around big data, machine learning, artificial intelligence, and sometimes hard to, to understand, you know, how they may be similar or different. But as Amin mentioned, um, big data, what the first thing that comes to people's mind is that there's uh, it's a lot of data. It's just the amount of data. That, and as long as it's a lot of data, it's big data. But I guess the important point to understand here is that uh, we are not only talking about the volume of data, we are talking about uh, diversity in data and variety. So we are looking at text, numbers, images, videos, and et cetera. And um, another dimension to that is that not only are we looking at all different types of data and large volume of it, we're also looking at uh, an on ongoing uh, production of data. So one, one very good example would be social media data, data that we produce on YouTube, on, on Facebook, on Twitter. So uh, it's on, on an ongoing basis. You create um, videos, images on Instagram, for instance, text, numbers. So lots of information is produced on an ongoing basis. And that's what that's why it makes it big data, because you, you have such a complex set of data to process. But then also, as I mean mentioned, artificial intelligence, it's about intelligence and making decisions, uh, uh, but then by, by machine, right? So we, we still do have human beings using their intelligence to make decisions. But in, in AI, you, you have machines that uh, take advantage of the data, take it as input and, and make decisions, make recommendations. Um, so obviously, um, 
when, when you have uh, platforms like this, it, it impacts our lives in various ways. For instance, you may have heard that increasingly various services are being digitalized. For instance, today was there was an announcement that some um, brokers and smaller banks have started to offer digital loan um, approval uh, systems that you don't need to have contact with humans. It would take a lot less time for your loan application, home loan or car loan application to be processed. And what the system does, it asks you for a lot of information. And once they receive this, the, the information, they may actually have access to some other information, for example, you know, social media and other publicly available information to process your application. And in a lot shorter amount of time, you would get a response whether or not your application is approved. So uh, as you can see in this example, you know, it's, it's providing benefits and, and, you know, lots of advantages for us. Um, and um, in, in, in other contexts, for example, you know, in health context, that also is benefiting uh, human uh, individuals and members of the society in various ways. When, when the health uh, organizations and health service providers, they have access to all various set of data and they are able to immediately uh, recover those data and provide recommendations that, you know, in regards to health, when they collect uh, information about your health and well-being and symptoms and, and all that. So uh, there's obviously a lot of uh, opportunities moving forward in, in all different sectors. But um, on, on the other hand, there's, uh, I, we also appreciate that some members of the community um, may still not have um, developed the, the trust on, on these systems. And when we, for example, look at driverless cars, you know, uh, some, some people have a lot of trust on them, some, some, some may not. Um, because the, these systems, they, in my opinion, they, they like uh, in early ages, like human beings, like um, babies, you know, they, they still are learning and it takes time for them to learn better and to improve. So this is like a two side coin. In, in one side of it, you have a lot of potentials, a lot of opportunities and uh, untapped opportunities. But then other side of it, that there are some risks, there may be some adverse outcomes. And there could be security privacy related risks. There could be risk in terms of recommendations and the, the decisions that they, in, that they make and that could directly or indirectly impact us, right? So there's two sides to it. And because of all this, um, we, we are seeing a lot of demand and potential in the field. Yeah, definitely. There's definitely lots of um, great things about big data and AI and what it's doing for our world. But I guess there's also the consideration of um, what's potentially the downside of having all of this data and using it um, in the future. I guess that's um, really makes me want to ask the question of how exactly, how interconnected are um, AI and big data? Um, what is the relationship between, between those two? Um, I mean, would you be able to shed some light on that? Yeah, uh, sure. That's a really good question. And, you know, the, highlight the main differences, you know, between uh, AI and big data, but at the same time, you know, how they are related and, you know, uh, uh, highlight that, you know, we are at the age of big data and artificial intelligence, you know, because we had this artificial intelligence, uh, you know, uh, since you know, 30, 40 years ago, but, you know, why we have this boom of, you know, application of artificial intelligence and industry 4.0, this is very highly related to the big data because now we are generating huge amount of information we have smart entities that sense the real world and generate you know lots of information uh, lots of data generated on social media even companies you know started to engage you know with the data generated on social media to uh, improve their business processes so this is really a very good opportunity for uh, learning algorithms and artificial intelligence methods to use this data. So using big data as the fuel you know, for the learning algorithms. And then when you have access you know, to this huge amount of information and knowledge, then you can improve the decision-making and for example, automating processes or think of you know, lots of other applications, uh, especially you know, from the business point of view. Just for example, consider applications in policing, in banking, in education, in health, so any sector that you see, you know, there are lots of good applications of artificial intelligence and big data. For example, understanding the customer service, uh, customer success and customer journey. This is one of the things that most of the companies you know, now started to focusing on and they try to mimic and ingest information from different islands of data and analyze you know, those information and then try, for example, to 
uh, have a very personalized recommender, uh, recommender system you know, to offer, for example, products or identify customers you know, that need to change the products. So this happens you know, in any sectors, you know, from health to banking to education. Uh, the other thing you know, that we can also focus here is the word specifically intelligence in artificial intelligence. So intelligence you know, is the ability to learn from experience and use you know, the domain knowledge. So any expert in any field that we consider, you know, they have this intelligence. Let's say a business analyst in banking who is expert, for example, in risk analysis, you know, they have 20, 30 years of experience. They have lots of, for example, trails of data and, uh, you know, important patterns, you know, in their mind, and they can easily identify some sort of cases. What if, for example, AI can mimic that specific knowledge and then use that in decision-making and choosing the best next step? So this can happen in education, in health, and all these uh, applications, you know, can focus on both business and also the customer point of view. Thank you, Stephanie, back to you. Thanks for that. Oh, I guess there's so many ways that um, big data and AI can be used. I just want to hear from Babak in terms of like if, um, depending on how good the data or how accurate the data is, does that impact the AI by any chance? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, good question, Stephanie. And, and if you go back to, you know, the term AI, artificial intelligence, you know, intelligence has been around from day one that humans started, you know, life on this planet so intelligence is all about um, making making uh, decisions uh, and for for that you, you need you need data you need good data uh, for example you know we all are conscious of what we eat on a daily basis right and when you go to supermarkets you, you look at the product and you look at you know the star rate you look at the you know level of sugar uh, energy and, and all that and some people are very conscious about that and we in fact, make our choices on the basis of the information that's available on, on the product. And if information on that product is wrong or is inaccurate or is incomplete, that certainly impacts our decision making. And um, that could adversely actually impact our health. For example, if you are allergic to, to something, right? So same thing applies to artificial intelligence. The difference here is uh, artificial intelligence, it is the machine's intelligence, not the human. And that's why it's called artificial intelligence. And, and same thing applies to artificial intelligence. So at, as I mean said, you know, artificial intelligence has been around for decades. What has changed is the level of data that's available to the system to make decisions and recommendations. In the past, 30 years ago, 40 years ago, only limited amount of data was available to us. We, we had very limited computing facilities and tools to extract, store, and use the data. Whereas today, uh, you, you have a lot of computer tools that allow you to uh, collect all this information and process them. So going back to, you know, example of, um, you know, nutrition on a daily basis, uh, you could have a, an artificial intelligence system that you could just scan the product's barcode and it could tell you what are the ingredients and uh, it could tell you about, you know, uh, calories, uh, sugar um, and, and all that. Uh, and you could actually compare it against your own needs and preferences. Imagine we had a system like that. So you, you would be in a lot better position to make decisions to, to see which product would suit you better. So what's happening here is that we have a machine, uh, an application, a software tool that is uh, making decisions, recommendations, and that is intelligent only because of the large amount of data that's available to it. So they're definitely hand in hand, very related, but yet uh, they, they need their own uh, separate uh, attention. Yeah, definitely. It sounds like um, there needs to be care when considering um, large sets of data. I um, mean, I guess a lot of the people in the audience would be wanting to know about um, what they would be learning in courses that relate to data science or business analytics and any applications of um, big data as well to perhaps areas such as health. Um, I mean, would you be able to tell us a bit more about um, the postgrad program for data science? Yeah, sure, Stephanie. So uh, in the co uh, postgrad course data science that we have in uh, Department of Computing, you know, we have a true balance of a statistical and computational methods. So for example, the statistical methods, you know, from predictive modeling to test of significance and interpretation of analytical results. Computational methods, for example, focus on units that focus on machine learning, big data, cloud computing, visualization techniques. So we provide lots of interesting uh, units in the department that, you know, 
uh, teach students how to organize huge amount of information, how to curate the data. So this data curation you know, could include, for example, uh, cleaning and preparing the data. It can include, for example, uh, techniques for ingesting the data, uh, techniques for transformation, and also adding value. So lots of techniques you know, will be uh, taught you know, in order to extract information from different types of data. As Babak mentioned, you know, we are dealing with the variety of the data you know, in the big data. Uh, problems, you know, we have, let's say, a structured, semi-structured and unstructured data. Unstructured could be image, video, audio, text. So there are lots of techniques, you know, that we teach students, you know, to be able to extract information from text or image. Let's say, for example, enrich them, you know, link them, and then provide, for example, some sort of backend as knowledge lakes and data lakes, you know, for a better processing. Also, we have units, you know, to uh, teach students in processing the huge amount of information, like, for example, you know, techniques like MapReduce, you know, how we can use that to deal with millions and millions of records you know, generated every second, and also uh, courses for visualizing the information. So, as I highlighted, a true balance of statistical and computational methods in those units. Yeah, definitely. It's really great to hear that there's such a great balance between the different skills that people might need if they want to deal with big data or AI related fields. And as a student myself, I've definitely learned lots of different um, methods of dealing with and processing huge amounts of data since um, with big data, we're talking about like millions of lines of data and also um, unstructured data as well. So like texts and files. I'd also like to know what the difference between this data science um, degree and what a business analytics degree business analytics degree would be. Um, Babak, would you be able to shed some light on that? Yeah, sure. Uh, that's, a, that's a very good question. And I, and I assume that a lot of participants may have, you know, the same question of, you know, what would be the difference? Uh, firstly, I'd like to emphasize that, you know, programs like this, we, we do offer Master of Business Analytics. And the assumption here is that uh, a lot of students come from um, other backgrounds, you know, non-computing sometimes. Some of them may have some computing uh, related degrees as a background, and but we assume that um, there's, there's not a lot of background in analytics. So these courses have been designed designed for people who may not have much background and exposure to analytics. Um, so that's important to, to understand and acknowledge. But in, in, in Master of Business Analytics, we, um, as, as from the name is clear, we have uh, two very certain uh, focus. Uh, the, the very focus is on analytics. And as part of the analytics, um, you will learn how to uh, use data to make predictions and to, to make visualizations and to describe the, the, the scenarios and the circumstances and to be able to make decisions. And as Amin said, uh, as part of analytics, we do also offer uh, expo uh, fundamentals of computing and, and programming and databases. Uh, and also we expose the students to statistical and uh, mathematical modeling. But then there is other side to our program, which is the business side, right? The business analytics. So as part of the business related units, uh, we, 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 we try to develop students appreciation and understanding of the application uh, and the people organization on side of the analytics. So <clears throat> students will have the opportunity to uh, ha have focus and uh, take electives in accounting, finance, marketing, economics, etc. And be, to be able to develop a domain related expertise. So depending on your prior background, uh, for example, if you've been working in marketing uh, or you have expertise in product management, uh, in finance, in accounting and all that, you'll be able to, to, to use those skills and, and learn how to uh, add to that and be able to uh, use your an new analytical skills to be able to solve problems related to, to that particular discipline. So that, that would be, in my opinion, a, a key distinctive factor. It's a mix of business, statistics, and, and computing. And we do have focus on soft skills, uh, communication, presentation, problem solving skills, as well as hard skills, programming, and, and, and modeling. Thanks for that. I can definitely tell that it's very multidisciplinary and you do learn about um, many different things like the business aspect and also the more um, statistical and computing side of things as well. Um, I'd also like to hear from Isabel, who's been a past student, um, and her experiences and what she's doing now in terms of using data in her research and things like that as well. 
Yeah. Hi, everyone. So as I already mentioned before, um, I graduated from Master of Applied Statistics degree um, from Macquarie University. So like throughout the study, I think um, I, I have exposed myself to learning a lot of different like programming language. Like I think not it's not like like computing is separate totally away from um, mathematics and um, statistics. So we actually kind of like blend it together. So I'll give you an example, because I'm also doing teaching. There are a lot of um, data science students, they would take advanced like um, statistics as their elective. Um, so that is to say, so computing, statistics, and um, data an analytics, they all like three in one. Um, so throughout my study, I, um, heavily used on R as my programming language. Um, so I think programming should never be a, just a degree. So I think like when we use statistics and mathematics and um, computing um, all together, so we can provide a better solution for the business. Um, so I think our degree is really practical. That's why we call it applied statistics. So we all focus on um, the apply side. How can how can we solve the real business issue? How can we use the data to um, give the better interpretation, um, better like prediction? So uh, that is to say, in statistics, we all learn a lot of modeling, for instance, um, GLM. We also do a lot of optimization. We learn a lot of like optimization algorithm, for instance, for instance, EM algorithm, which you will learn regardless you study um, statistics or computing. Um, we also learn like newton rosen So that is to say statistics and programming, they are um, closely connected to each other, okay? So um, also for modeling part, for modeling part is also very important part of um, statistics because statistics is about um, building the model, help them to give a better solution. Um, I'll give the example of my uh, career path. So I also do, um, I'm also a research assistant from Macquarie Hospital. So one of my projects is to use the survival analysis data to um, predict the survival rate. And we're also interested in what kind of factor that impact on their survival rate. Because that specific disease, we call it motor neuron disease. That disease is very deadly. Once people got that disease, they will pass away within two years. So it is very um, great interest for doctors to know what kind of thing will impact on their survival rate. Um, for instance, the current uh, measurement of that disease is more like a binary. For instance, whether you can talk, whether you can grab things. But for us, what we want to do, we want to build a model to use biomarker to pre better predict um, their survival rate because we believe that that will be more um, objective, will be less subjective based on doctor experience. Yeah, so I think um, statistics is very practical um, discipline. So a lot of people think of studies in mathematics, they all, they all kind of the same, they all like um, super theoretical, but I believe the degree that I finished is very practical and really helped me to, um, um, to target the real life solution. Yeah, definitely. Thanks, Stephanie. Yeah, I'll definitely agree with that. Um, in terms of the practicalities of um, statistics, even in the present landscape, you're looking around and you see there's such a huge influence of big data and AI. And the potential, I think, is just going to keep growing um, and companies are going to keep incorporating analytics into their st strategies and really try to build that area of their business. Um, and hearing about your experience, um, your example in health makes me quite curious about um, if Babak has any examples of um, applications of big data throughout different industries, for example, or perhaps the same industry. Yeah, sure, um, and I'll probably give you two two examples. Um, one example is is in in, in the industry in, in insurance industry, and you know we all may have purchased uh, various in insurance products. You know, car insurance, home insurance, personal insurance products, and what you may notice is that you get different. Uh, price uh, from different insurance providers you know you get when you when you obtain codes you get different prices and you may wonder why for the very same address you know you, ha you may have to pay uh, different uh, fees for for your car insurance and the reason for that is that each of these companies they have their own modeling uh, and uh, you know they have their own data science uh, actuarial studies as well as you know business analytics experts that use various um, you know 
data sets to, to model the, the risk. So the way that different companies model the risk, the, the tools they use, the models they use, and the, the data that they use uh, determines and, and uh, different risk levels. So you may notice that for the very same car, when you change your address, uh, the, the, the fee for the insurance changes substantially, right? Uh, for some insurance providers, whereas for some other insurance providers, it doesn't change. And that's why the government always, you know, advises uh, that people should shop around and, and make sure that they, they get the best price. It's just because there's different modeling uh, out there and then that produces um, uh, different results. Uh, and as I said, it's because of different models and different data sets that may be available to them. Another example is in the healthcare, and that's a project that I was uh, involved um, just recently. And you may have noticed that, especially after COVID and pandemic hit, uh, a lot of us go to, uh, go to the internet and use online forums, social media to, to look for information. A lot of us participate in conversations and uh, we post questions, uh, especially for you know, some, um, some more serious matters and um, uh, illnesses. Uh, if someone is experiencing cancer or, or, or if you are uh, you know, looking after someone who uh, has cancer, you know, we obviously have a lot of questions in mind and it's not easy to just you know, reach out to your doctor and ask those questions. And it's really hard to find somebody who can help you. So, so you go to these online forums and you post questions. And uh, this project that we did was with Cancer Council and we, they have a very active uh, forum digital forum where uh, people who experience cancer and recovered or the ones that have you know, already you know been diagnosed with cancer or people who are looking after loved ones they, they use the community on a regular basis to to post questions and you may be surprised to know that uh, a lot of other members of the community you know they read the post they they respond to that. They, they, you know, they empathize and sympathize with each other. They provide support. And so there's there's a lot of conversations on an ongoing basis. So what what we wanted to do as part of this project was how can we take advantage of the conversation that's been exchanged on these communities? And you can imagine that we can apply this to other contexts. How can we take advantage of it? understand uh, what people are talking about so that we can better tailor the support that we can uh, make available to these people so that we can better provide relevant information. So uh, Cancer Council was interested to know in what way they can uh, help the moderators, community moderators, and uh, uh, you know improve the, 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 the policies and the healthcare service available. So what we did, we, we started to uh, you know um, obviously um, remove all the identifiable information information due to ethical uh, considerations. And, and after that, we, we analyzed the text um, and we looked back in, you know, a couple of years ago and looking at the text and each post mes uh, each message is posted on the website, we tried to understand each word and each block uh, uh, and then extract meaning and categorize them. And we designed a, a system, a machine learning system that would be able to be trained, which means, you know, we started with some data to create the system, then we use some additional data to make sure that uh, what the system is doing is accurate enough. And right now the system is, is able to, uh, on, a, on a real time basis, capture uh, conversations and posts and uh, give uh, alerts and, and messages to community moderators and community owners uh, that in what way the, the person can be supported in what way they can be helped and in what way uh, uh, you know relevant information can be provided to that person wow that sounds really really cool especially i think hearing about these two examples of um data being used in insurance and also in this case to look for and filter through forums and the wording in those forums to help people and i think that is um something that data can do there is lots of things that it can applies to and it can assist those in need as well. So I'd really love to hear if Amin has any examples of any work that he's done recently in relation to big data or AI. Yeah, sure. Uh, so uh, let us you know, think about just, for example, healthcare by itself and understand what are the applications of data science you know, could be in healthcare. So just think about, for example, data science for medical imaging, you know, which is one of the most applications that you know currently using there. Uh, data science for genomics, you know, drug discovery, you know, with data science, predictive analytics, 
in healthcare, you know, monitoring pa patient health, uh, and for example, tracking or preventing some sort of you know diseases, uh, or even for example, providing uh, cognitive assistance to help uh, nurses or doctors or even patients. So this also could be include lots of uh, smart entities. You know, we see the use of lots of smart entities these days in any uh, sectors, especially in health. So lots of sensors, for example, can be developed to analyze, for example, the sweat and then tell us if this person has anxiety, depression, or for example, using too much alcohol, or for example, connected to uh, diabetics. So this is actual, actually one of the projects you know, that we have and focusing on, for example, uh, the health of you know, the workers in some sort of organization. Uh, you can think about, for example, uh, cameras uh, you know, uh, in different places. Just think about, for example, smart classrooms, smart airports. So there are lots of things you know, that can be uh, detected in real time and provide alert and suggestions. So we have one project, for example, for smart uh, airports and the project that we have developing sensors to detect explosives in airports, for example. So these are the uh, interesting projects and uh, on, ongoing one that we have. We have lots of interesting projects, you know, with uh, banking and fintech sector. So using data science to, for example, revolutionize payment and transactions, uh, credit risk evaluation, for example, revenue or debt collection. So all these you know, are uh, projects that we have PhD students, for example, working uh, you know, on these projects with banking. Customer journey is another one. Uh, fraud detection, money laundry, uh, portfolio opti optimization, for example. Uh, in one of the projects that I'm leading with Tata Consultancy Services and Westpac, you know, we have five PhD students who are focusing on these interesting ideas. And you, we are injecting, you know, 10 postdocs, you know, to uh, this specific project in FinTech as well. Another interesting project that we have is in education. Uh, so one of them focus on automating exam markings. Let's say, for example, you know, we saw that during the COVID situation, one of the challenges uh, could be to you know, reducing instructors' workload, especially in online teaching. So you know, uh, instructors and academics are dealing with thousands of students. So what if you know we can pro use data science and artificial intelligence in automating the exam marking? So this is a very interest, interesting project that we have, and we recently submitted a patent for that. Uh, two postdoc and uh, two PhD students working on this project. And the other one, you know, we have a smart classrooms. So let's say, for example, using sensors and CCTVs in the classroom to identify, you know, the, uh, you know, lots of dimensions, you know, around teaching and learning. Let's say, for example, a students are using, you know, too much uh, you know, mobile in the class. So is there anything related, for example, to the content of the course? You know, they are not interested, how we can motivate them to engage with the class, for example. Or we have a smart pen, you know, you can do the exam, just, you know, use your mobile phone using, for example, the camera of a cell phone or laptop, writing on a paper and all the information you know, will be collected and automated into the system. And then we use OCR techniques, you know, to turn that into uh, you know, uh, characters that can be understandable, you know, by the system. And from there, we do lots of things. So one of the sub projects that we have there is contextualizing the rubric. So as soon as, for example, they write something or draw something, you know, we can provide some sort of, for example, insights and knowledge, you know, around those activities that the students are doing. So these are some examples of the projects related to data science and AI that we are doing. Yeah, it sounds like there's definitely heaps of different applications, like many different applications in health and also looking at smart airports or smart classrooms or like automatic um, exam marking. I think like there's so many different avenues that people who, people who study data and AI can go into, which I think is um, something in, on our minds as students is after doing our degree, um, what can we go into and what kind of jobs are we thinking um, of um, pursuing after our degree and it has been shown that in recent res reports that data analysts and business analysts are in demand and um, over the last five years apparently there's been an increase of about 65 percent in the demand as well so how do you guys think that the landscape will change in the next five years and do you think there's any challenges for the industry as well um, Isabel as someone who's just um, recently graduated what do you think 
I believe that we're definitely um, in demand. Um, for instance, I'll give an example of the medical industry. Um, although we believe that in 2021, we have really strong medical um, technology, we have all the good like um, methods to help people to diagnose their disease, but we still like we still see a lot of uh, issue, for instance, uh, the, diff, the the not accurate measurement. So what we're gonna do, what we're gonna do, we actually try to uh, push more um, statistical method to give them um, to give them the optionality to improve their system, to improve the medical system. Um, so I believe that as we, uh, at least in medical uh, industry, there will be a huge demand for us. Um, another thing is I believe that, especially in finance industry, for instance, that analyst, um, for instance, um, marketing researcher, they are all well-paid job and then um, they require us to have a statistics skill, have computing skill. Um, yeah, I believe that, especially after post-COVID, um, I believe there will be a huge demand for us. Yeah, that's yes. definitely great to hear. And I feel like there's definitely lots of potential in this industry. Um, I guess one last question from my end, and then we'll move on to some of the questions from the audience. Um, what kind of uh, skills or um, I guess, what people, qualities of people do you think are good for people who want to learn um, data analytics or business analytics? Um, Babak, do you have any thoughts? Baba? yeah. Yes, sure. Um... I guess if I if I put myself in the shoes of the audience today, if I wanted to do a master of business analytics or master of data science today, uh, I would just use the same advice. You know that uh, my my advice is just to reflect on your own strengths and reflect on on your own uh, interest and your prior experience. You know, I guess um, the the degrees the degrees that you may have done as part of your bachelor or any you know uh, other professional uh, degrees sh uh, that you may have done uh, is very important. Uh, as you may have heard, you know, uh, based on the examples that you know Amin and I shared today, we do have all different uh, applications from all different sectors, and you know, business analytics and data science have definitely uh, multiple dimensions to them. We we have uh, very technical dimensions to them in which you, you need to do lots of programming and you, you need to be comfortable and enjoying to do the programming, you know, using various uh, programming languages, R, Python is just some of the examples, be, be comfortable working with databases and data. And then uh, there all, there's also a hardware side to it that you, you, you might be interested in developing tools and developing and creating hardware and putting together you know, various uh, tools in, in creating a particular machine or systems. And there's another dimension to it, which is the application side of it, uh, that you may be interested in you know, the strategic side of decision making, dealing with, uh, working with managers, working with people in different departments. You may be enjoying, you know, the soft side of analytics and uh, business requirement analysis, working on business processes, uh, you know, in different contexts, in marketing, in accounting, in finance. Uh, so uh, there's all different, all these opportunities available. And uh, my, 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 um, take on that is that you really need to reflect on your own expertise and interest and try to develop that expertise. And uh, you, I, I wouldn't uh, encourage, uh, you know, um, candidates to, to consider a particular uh, dimension of analytics just because of the demand in the market, because demand is really high. It's, it's there. And um, I would encourage you to reflect on your own experience and past, uh, uh, you know, background and, and try to develop and build on it um, and know that there is there's a lot of opportunities out there. Of course, you need some fundamentals of, you know, programming, some fundamentals of statistical modeling, some fundamentals for domain expertise, be it in health, uh, in, in, you know, uh, retail or other sectors. But then moving forward, uh, you can definitely, you know, uh, um, pick your own expertise and interests and, and focus on that. And the, the beauty of the, the Master of Business Analytics and Master of Data Science is that you will have um, uh, exposure and uh, opportunity to choose various electives and specializations. So uh, as, as you start the program and as you start to develop understanding and understand your interests, you will have the, the opportunity to, to develop your expertise based on your interests. Yeah, that's some really great advice there. 
um, in terms of like following what you're interested in and also your past experience as well. Um, I mean, is there anything that you'd also like to add in terms of knowledge that they might gain from um, the data science degree and what might give them a competitive edge um, after they graduate? Yeah, so uh, thank you, Babak, for you know, covering almost everything there. Uh, I think that would be uh, very helpful. So uh, just focusing on uh, the data science uh, uh, postgrad degree that we are offering, we mainly, you know, the, you know, this is something that attracted by students, you know, with a numerate degree, the engineering, accounting, uh, science. So we ideally want the students you know, to have a good mathematics and some computing background. Uh, uh, if, if we want, for example, to consider, you know, what are the units and in, involvements, you know, uh, students will be involved in. So they will start with, for example, uh, understanding the data. Uh, techniques for organize, or, organizing the data, so different types of databases. So lots of techniques, for example, for data curation. So they need to have a very good, for example, uh, knowledge of uh, you know, stats. And there are lots of units you know, that we provide you know, to help them uh, you know, prepare the data for analytics. Then uh, more you know, coding skills, uh, as Bobak highlighted, we use Python for analyzing and processing the data. And there are lots of you know, different techniques you know, that they will you know, deal with for visualizing and uh, uh, interacting you know, with the data. So uh, as I highlighted earlier, you know, we have you know, two uh, uh, main types of units. You know, some of them focus on computational methods like machine learning, big data, you know, cloud computing, visualization techniques. And some focus on uh, statistical methods like, for example, predictive modeling or, uh, modeling or interpretation of analytical results. Thanks for that. Um, really insightful answers from everyone. Uh, so that was the last of my questions. So we'll try and move on to some of the live Q&A questions from the audience. So we have one from Kui Do who has asked, given the risks of, uh, risk of bias when deploying AI algorithms and big data, do you have any recommendations to mitigate or alleviate such problems? Um, so would one of you like to answer that question? Min? Uh, I handle that, Babak, Babak, is that okay if I handle this question? Yeah, sure, absolutely. Uh, so, you know, when we deal with biases, you know, this is more, you know, related to human errors and, uh, you know, there are lots of interesting techniques you know, that we uh, have in uh, machine learning, like, for example, reinforcement learning. You know, we try to involve, you know, human in the loop and then, for example, you know, take some samples from the data you know, go back to real humans and you know, try, for example, to assess the data, the quality of the data. And then, you know, over time, you know, we want, for example, to uh, refine the information in the system. So there are lots of uh, interesting techniques that you know, can be involved here, including crowdsourcing, uh, for example, attention-based mechanisms, you know, try to identify important features extracted from the data. But again, you know, they, uh, they can use lots of, for example, techniques to mimic the knowledge of domain experts uh, using, you know, human in the loop and crowdsourcing techniques. So this is normally, you know, the approach that we use. Uh, some of the very leading and interesting works you know, from Stanford University, uh, it's, it's called snorkel. So even a snorkel, for example, use, you know, the same techniques uh, to label the data. So when, you know, we label the data, actually, you know, we use uh, the experience of the domain uh, knowledge workers in order to tagging and labeling the data. So you know, they use lots of automated uh, crowdsourcing and human in the loop techniques you know, to do that. So even I would say, for example, a uh, few months or for example, years ago, having a high quality data, labeled data, you know, was a big challenge. But now using you know, these techniques, we can easily uh, label the data. So Babak, would you like to add anything to this? Thank you, I mean, uh, you made very good points uh, in terms of the techniques and tools available to address this. In fact, uh, this is actually a very important question that was raised and in increasingly governments and organizations are being aware of, you know, um, transparency, explainability, and accountability of artificial intelligence and analytics. So uh, my 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 uh, part to that uh, would be from the people people side. Um, you know, a lot of bias, uh, a lot of adverse outcomes of AI is generated uh, because of the the process 
processes that are in place and because of the thinking that and the thinking style in place for a very long time. So if we talk about, for example, bias in, in AI, we should go back to the brains and minds of those people who are actually doing the coding. So for instance, uh, from the audience here, you know, we, we, we may have a lot of um, females and male participants. But then if you have a group of 10 developers, all of them male developing a system, it's really hard, even if they do their best to have a you know unbiased system, it's really hard for, for a group of males to think on behalf of females. So it's, it's important to have a balanced representation of gender. So you can see that there are some procedural things that we can do uh, in order to address that. There are some psychological side to it. There are some governance side to it. You know, Australian government in 2019 for the first time released a framework for AI ethics, and they have listed a number of principles for organizations to make sure the system is unbiased. So a very good question. And there is the people side to it, and there is the technical side to it. Thanks for answering that question. Uh, so we'll move on to the next question that we've had. So the question is, how is data science used in healthcare and in the medical space? And what roles can you apply for after completing a master of data science? Okay, so briefly, I highlighted this in one of the examples in healthcare. So it could be, for example, data science for medical imaging, for uh, gen genomics, drug discovery, predictive analytics in healthcare, monitoring, for example, patients, uh, health records and also, for example, cognitive assistant to assist patients or, for example, uh, staffs in hospitals, like, for example, GPs or nurses. So from the roles, you know, after doing you know, uh, courses like uh, data science, you know, you can uh, be a data analyst, a business analyst, a data engineer, data scientist, chief data scientist. So there's a different levels of roles and it depends, you know, what sort of the techniques and skills you developed over time. Let's say if you are a very good developer and you know have hands on, for example, system setup, you can you know, be a very good data engineer. So data engineer is quite you know, in high demand in uh, today's market. Data scientists, you know, they have a very good uh, uh, mathematical and a statistical understanding, but at the same time, you know, they are very familiar you know, with the computational methods. You do not need to be a very you know, high skill developer to be a data scientist. But you know you should have skills to deal with the research problem of understanding the data. So that's a very important skill. And then you know we have you know we go more high level like for example data analyst or business analyst. So you will be expert in using some tools, for example, from let's say Microsoft or uh, let's say for example IBM or Amazon or SaaS. So there are different tools, you know. The help in organizing or visualizing or analyzing the data more for example business intelligence tools uh, uh, business analysts and data analysts you know they are more you know in that level so again you know, they do not contribute much in development it's it's it would be you know added value to you know have those coding skills so always you know when you when we discuss uh, with the students and you know, skills related to data science and data engineering so coding you know would, would be something that you need to develop over time it's fine that you know you do not have a you know very high skill at the starting of the program but over time you know you need to develop those skills how back would you like to add anything to that i guess you you covered all uh, most of the important part and i probably would like to give chance to so to, to to other questions thanks Amin. yeah thanks Amin and Barak. Uh, so we do have another question actually, and this one is quite specific. So we've mentioned two or three degrees. Uh, so we've mentioned the Master of Data Science, the Master of Business Analytics, and also the Master of Applied Statistics. And uh, Paul wants us to know, uh, answer the question, could we explain which one would be the best for him if he's interested in becoming a business analyst in a big company, like a, for example, a bank? Um, Babak, maybe you'd like to answer this question? Yes, yeah, sure. Uh, firstly, it's really hard to say which one is best. I would say they all are good uh, and it really depends on your background and your objectives. But then business analyst, because I used to be a business analyst for, for a number of years. As a business analyst, your role is to work somewhere between 
computer scientists and the development team and the business people. So you work like a translator uh, between these two teams. And given that, I would probably, uh, not that I'm, because the program is what we offer, but I would probably encourage uh, considering Master of Business Analytics because we do have units uh, in terms of uh, understanding business uh, needs, change management, process management, and uh, the, the program gives you exposure to, to the business side of analytics. If you tend to be you know, uh, more focused on the technical side and development side, I would encourage considering Master of Data Science. But if you are more interested into you know, communication with the business, you know, decision-making, process management, requirement analysis, and all that, then I would encourage uh, considering Master of Business Analytics. Um, I mean, did you have anything you want to add to that, or um, did, did Barack basically cover most of the yeah, answers? Yeah, it was uh, very well covered. Thank you very much, Barack. Oh, uh, so we might have time for one more question. Uh, so we have um, Edinburgh, who's asked, who's very interested in driverless cars, and if we could explain how we would tap into this industry and work there. So if any of you guys would like to answer that question. I'll leave it to Amin. Yeah, so uh, this is one of the interesting projects you know, that we have in the Department of Computing and you know, some of our academics you know, the very expert in this domain. Uh, they are also developing some courses you know, related to that. Uh, this is a very interesting domain because you see uh, cars tracing lots of information so I want to highlight that, okay, next to big data and data discussions that we have, you know, it's also important to discuss about some metadata like provenance. So metadata is information about data. We are intended to trace lots of information. So I just give you simple examples. You know, when you have a cell phone, you know, you have lots of applications, you know, on your cell phone, and there are lots of algorithms, you know, try, try to trace, you know, what sort of apps you have there, you know, how frequent you are using them, so even in one app, for example, what sort of data you are generating. So that's a very good example of tracing and metadata. The more metadata and cross-cutting aspects around data you know, we generate, you know, the better understanding you know, we will have uh, for the first class citizen data. And it will help us in, let's say, for example, predicting and analytics. So this is a very important case in driverless cars. So lots of algorithms you know, try to trace everything. Even, for example, in one day, you know, you can have, you know, gigabytes of data, you know, traced about the performance of engine or there are lots of sensors, you know, try to, let's say, trace information, you know, about the environment, about the weather, about the traffic, about the streets. So all these information together, you know, could be used in, for example, uh, scenarios, uh, like, for example, you have heard about, you know, Tesla, that, you know, now, you know, uh, the car can easily go from A to B. So, it has different sensors and visions, you know, try to uh, understand and predict, for example, accidents or finding the fastest way. So it's a huge domain and lots of interesting applications. And one of those domains that, you know, uh, metadata is quite, you know, important, you know, next to the data that generated, you know, every second in deriving. Thanks for that. It definitely sounds really interesting. We might be seeing a lot more driverless cars on the road in the future. So we're going to have to wrap that up there um, because we're um, coming to the end of this webinar. I'd really like to thank all of the panelists on the panel and also everyone who was in the audience and listened to this webinar. If you have any further questions, please feel free to book a one-on-one -on -one consultation with us. So you can either follow the link on this slide or scan the QR code. Um, yeah, definitely feel free to let us know of any questions that you have in any of these consultation sections. And this link will also be shared in the chat box. Thanks again and have a great evening, everyone.